So here we are in lecture 30, titled Force is the Strength of an Interaction. Okay, so obviously we'll be talking about force. But uh, the next lecture we do, lecture 31, will be specifically on Newton's laws. Right, the last lecture we did, we kind of motivated the law of, or the principle of inertia, which will be stated in Newton's first law. And today we're going to motivate his other two laws, the second and the third law. Okay? But we're not really going to talk about Newton's laws in particular. Instead, we're going to talk about what I like to call ice rink physics. Okay? So, you know what an ice rink is, right? Yep, yes. Ice rink is where you go to skate. And if you've ever skated, you know that it's relatively frictionless. And so if two people go out into the middle of an ice rink and they, one of them pushes the other, what's going to happen? They'll start going forward for this. Let's assume they don't fall over, right? It's not an aggressive mean push. What's going to happen? Let's say these are the two ice skaters and they're in the middle of the ice rink. If this guy pushes on this guy, what happens? He's going to start sliding. Who is? The guy. So you're saying that if this guy pushes on this guy, it's going to go like this? No, they're both going to go. Ah, very good. Yes. Yeah, so if this guy pushes on this guy, they're going to go like this, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so that's important to note. So we've got a couple of friends. We'll call them Alex and uh, the Bartleby. All right. Okay. Alex and Bartleby, A and B, uh, go in the ice rink and they decide to have a little push-off competition, right? And so a bystander is going to observe these pushes that they're doing and going to make measurements, okay? And they're going to, in particular, measure their velocity. Now, before, they weren't moving, right? Afterwards, as you can see, right, depending on which way they push, you can find a line, right, in which the motion will take place in. And so you can really think of this as kind of a one-dimensional problem, right? If they decide to push this way, Here's the line. The line goes like this, right? So we may have to reorient, reorient our line, but we can find the line, right, where the motion is basically one-dimensional. And if you know that initially they were at not moving, so their velocity is zero, right? And then after they push off, they'll, you'll measure what their velocities are, okay? Okay. And maybe you're very careful to observe how long they're actually touching, right? Yes. And that'll be some time period, delta t. And if we take delta v and divide it by delta t, what do we get? What do we call this quantity, delta v divided by delta t? That's the change in the velocity divided by the change in the time. It's acceleration. That's acceleration, of course. So our observer is keeping track of the acceleration. So, so these guys try you know, these, this pushing competition, and we've recorded the following data. So in the first experiment, you can see it over here on the monitor, uh, A, uh, I, had an I have a printout of it here. I can just read from that instead. Uh, a had an acceleration of minus 2, and B had an acceleration of 1. Now, now why the minus 2? Why is it negative? Anybody? Um, <coughs> going in a negative direction. Well, more importantly, they're going in opposite directions, right? When they push off of each other, one will go one way, one will go the complete opposite direction. Okay? okay. That's where the negative comes from. So apparently, B is accelerating in the positive direction in all five of these experiments. <coughs> so we had the acceleration of A is minus 2, Maybe it's meters per second squared, it's feet per second squared, whatever, right? Not worry about units. And the acceleration of B was just one, okay? In the second experiment, B had an acceleration of two, and A had an acceleration of minus four. In the next one, B had an acceleration of three, whereas A had an acceleration of minus six. In the next one, B had an acceleration of four, and A had an acceleration of minus eight. And in the final experiment, B had an acceleration of 5, and A had an acceleration of minus 10. Now, you've already noticed that these accelerations have opposite signs, which makes sense since they're moving in opposite directions. But what else do you notice about the data that I put up on the board here? I love. Anything that, you, that pops out to you? Uh, I will point out that A, excuse me, B is a little bit bigger than A. That's why I used a font size for B that was just a little bit bigger than font size of A to show you that A and B are of different sizes, right? So we might have A is like this and B is a little bit bigger. All right, experiment number one. Acceleration of B is one, acceleration of A is minus two. That's how you read it, okay? Okay. So I'm writing the acceleration as A for acceleration, and then in the subscript I'll either put an A or a B, right? So that's the acceleration of A, okay? Okay. Is anything about this data pop out to you? The A has a greater acceleration than B. In all cases? Yeah. Uh, the, the, uh, 
twice as much. Except twice as much. Yeah, yeah interesting. So what if I were to take the ratio of, say, the acceleration of B divided by the acceleration of A? Right? In the first case, I would get 1 over minus 2. That's minus a half, right? In the second experiment, I would get 2 over minus 4, but that reduces to minus a half. In the third experiment, I would get 3 over minus 6, which is also going to reduce to minus a half. In the next experiment, I would get uh, 4 over minus 8, which is minus a half. You see where this is going. It seems that the ratio of their accelerations is negative. Yeah. That reflects the fact that they're moving in opposite directions, or accelerating in opposite directions. And a constant value. It doesn't change. Okay? The numbers themselves in the numerator and denominator may be different, but they reduce to the same ratio, a constant. Okay? So, given that this happens, A and B decided to get three other friends to come in, arrange to have uh, their other friends, uh, ranging in weight or size of the weeest Alex, or A, to the heftiest Egbert, or E, as it's labeled here. I also try to get the fonts to reflect their relative size. So here, E is very big, you see? Yeah. A is very small. Um, and they're going to have, they're going to, you know, do these pushing experiments again. But they want to do, they want to pair up, right? And how many different pairs can we come up with if we have five people that we might want to pair up? Anyone know how to answer that question? Five plus four plus three plus two plus one. Well, actually, it is, okay? But there's an easier way to think of it, right? If you're going to try to catalog all these interactions, think of a multiplication table. That's what I've drawn up here, right? And so in each column, you label them with the people, A through E, okay? Right. And this intersection with this diagonal in the middle there, that would be A and A paired up. Well, that doesn't make any sense. You can't pair a person up with himself. So the diagonal should not be included, right? right. This line here would be A paired up with B, right? This would be A paired up with C. You see how it's working, right? right. Yes. A with D, A with E. But on the other side of the diagonal, we have A paired up with B, but over here we have B paired up with A. And we already said we're not going to count that twice, right? So the only relevant entries of the table here are this little triangle here, right? And that's why it's 5 plus 4 plus 3 plus 2, right? Because this is basically Gauss's counting problem, right? In the end, though, it's whether we have, you know, uh, 5 factorial over 3 factorial times 2 factorial, or we just count up the, this, the, the entries in this side of the triangle. We get uh, 10 if we have 5 friends. Okay, so we're going to pair them all up, and then we're going to do an experiment, right, and see what these accelerations are. So. But I just want to point out that these entries here, right, what we're going to see are the accelerations of, say, C and the accelerations of D in their experiment in this block right here. Okay, so you see that the row number is the first letter, the column number is the second letter, right? Yes. So this represents the pairing of C and D, okay? Okay. And so here we have the experimental results. Um, and so when we paired A up with B, we saw that B had an acceleration of 1, a had an acceleration of minus 2, very similar to one of the experimental data points we had in the first experiment, where it just involved A and B pushing at various strengths, right? Yes. <clears throat> and you might recall that when they were pushing, right, the ratio was the same of their accelerations, regardless of how hard they pushed, yes? Yes. Didn't matter. Always came out the same. So here we're pairing up different individuals, right? And they're all of different sizes, right? A is the weeest, B e is the heftiest, okay? Okay. And so we look at these bearings and the accelerations, and nothing magical really pops out to us, right? We use the insight from the first experiment, right, where we said, well, let's look at the ratios and see what that does for us. And so now we get these ratios, right? We see that the, and I'm, I'm writing this, this term, alpha sub ba, for example, that means the ratio of the accelerations. Right? B divided by A, right? So it's the accelerate ratio of the acceleration of B to the acceleration of A. And that's what we get here. So if I said alpha CA, that would be the acceleration of C divided by the acceleration of A. And we find that that's equal to minus one third. Okay? Okay. So here we have all these numbers for all of these different people. So let's let's look at a specific interaction. Okay? Let's look at the uh, the first one, the alpha beta A, or alpha B A, right? So what is this saying? This is saying that A, the acceleration of A is equal to twice 
the acceleration of B. Right? Yeah. The sign difference, of course, is again reflecting the fact that they're pushing away. We could also look at alpha, let's look at uh, EA. So now we're comparing the, the weest with the heftiest, right? And so this, again, is equal to the acceleration of E divided by the acceleration of A. And that we found was equal to minus 1 over 5, which means that the acceleration of A is 5 times that experienced by E. And that kind of makes sense, right? If we've got the, you know, the, the really you know, big fella here and the, the little fella here, right? And the big fella gives a push, right? Big fella's going to move away pretty slowly, but the little guy's going to fly off pretty quickly, right? Yes. So that kind of makes sense, right? The heftier ones, the larger ones, the weightier ones, whatever you want to call it, right? Accelerate less, and the others accelerate more. And so we can kind of think of this ratio, if we wanted to, we could say, well, you know, it's, it's really, it's kind of like we have this movability index that we could imagine. As follows, right? And I'll call the movability in, and we'll put a subscript on it to indicate which object we're referring to, whether it's A or B or C or D. And so any of these alpha i j, where i and j are any index, right, uh, is equal to n i over n j. So we're saying the ratio of the accelerations is proportional to the ratio of the movabilities, right? Yes. So, you know, E is less movable than A is. Again, these are ratios, so you can't just automatically pull out their absolute, you know, magnitudes from one ratio, right? So I cannot definitively say that the movability of E is 1 and the movability of A is 5. What I can say is, is that uh, if the movability of E is 1, then the movability of A would be 5, right? Yes. Because the movability of A is 5 times greater than the movability of E, because A is smaller, right? Yes. So now... I also want to look at alpha E A. So using these definitions, right, that I gave, the ratio of the accelerations being equal to the ratio of the movabilities, right, for B A, that's N B over N A, and for the ratio of the accelerations for E A would be the ratio of the movabilities N sub E, which is the movability of E, over N sub B, the movability of B. Oh, wait, that should be an A. Sorry. Yeah, B A and E A. Good. What I'd like to do with this, and I may need a little more room. I want to predict what is the ratio. What is the ratio of accelerations for E and B? Okay. And we know that by this definition, that would be the ratio of the movability of E divided by the movability of B, right? Which I can rewrite in E over in A times in A over in B. This should start to remind you of the last thing we did with uh, geometrical optics when we talked about the principle of least time and predicting the index of refraction, right? Remember that? That was just two lessons ago. So this is the same thing as n sub E. You see why this is true? Because the n sub A's cancel. I'm left with n sub E over n sub B. This is n sub E over n sub A divided by n sub b over n sub a, just because of the way that fractions divide, right? And this now is equal to, well, n sub e over n sub a, that's just alpha ea, right? Divided by, that means this, right? n b over n a, right? That is just alpha b a. These two values that we measured, you see? Yes. And so this says that we can predict the ratio of the accelerations for E and B from the values for E and A and B and A, right? And we have those values on our table. Let's see if it matches up with the experimental data we have over here. So alpha E A, what is it? Can somebody read it from the data over there? What is that equal to? Minus one-fifth. Yeah, so that's one-fifth, right? Uh, I'm going to ignore the signs because the signs can throw things off. I actually had some trouble with this when I was thinking about this lecture. Uh, the signs can mess things up a little bit. So we'll just remember that whatever this is, it's going to be negative, okay? And I'm not going to worry about the signs. So I'll say that's one-fifth, right? And we're going to divide that by alpha BA. What's alpha BA? 
That's negative one half. Yeah, so that's a half. Which if I divide by half, it's the same thing as multiplying by 2 over 1. So that tells me that I predict that alpha EB will be equal to minus 2 over 5. And does that agree with the experimental results we have in the table? It's over there. Find alpha EB. Yes, yes it does. It's exactly the same as what we observed experimentally. You see? So we were able to predict the interaction between E and B based on the interaction between A and B and E and A. Okay? Okay. So let me suggest what this movability number is, right? Again, it's a number that tells you how movable something is. If something has a very high movability, it's easy to move. If something has a very low movability, it's hard to move. Okay? And let me just suggest that what this is. is the mass. Okay? Right. So the mass of A will be equal to 1 over the mass of A, uh, 1 over the movability of A, okay? Okay. And we could, if we wanted to come up with a dynamical definition of mass in terms of the ratio of accelerations using this, right? Yes. You'd need to pick like a standard. You'd say, okay, well I'm going to use my basis for mass measurements, I'm going to maybe make it the kilogram, and I'll let A be an object that has a mass of 1 kilogram, and then I could write out the mass of any other object in the universe by simply using these ratios of accelerations, okay? okay? And that would work fine. But I'm not going to worry about that too much. I'm just going to point out that this movability is really, it's the inverse. The inverse of the movability is the mass. And that makes sense, right? Because a heavy object is hard to move, right? Big, massive object, right? All right. Not easy to move. So one over a big number will be a very small number, right? Yes. Yeah. So it'll have a low movability. Whereas a really light object is easy to move. It should have a high movability. So if I have a teeny tiny object, something that weighs, you know, 0 0.0000001 kilograms, it's going to have a very big movability because 1 over a really tiny number is a really big number, right? Yes. So mass is, this, is 1 over this, this movability. This suggests that the strength of each interaction, right? These are all interactions, right? I've been careful not to use the word force, right? I may have said push or something like that, but these are interactions, right? I'm not going to go into any detail about what's happening. I don't really care. During the time that they're touching, all I know is that they're accelerating. Because they started at zero velocity, and after they touched for some period of time, they came out with a higher velocity. Okay? And so this interaction, I'm going to suggest that the strength of this interaction, right, we can define what the strength of interaction AI over NI, which is the same thing, as mi times ai, right? So I say i is just the particular element. It could be the mass of a and the acceleration of a, right? Yes. Which I'm going to call force. Okay. Okay? Right. So this, so what we see in here, right, this combination of terms, right, the acceleration divided by the movability or the mass times the acceleration, right, is the strength of this interaction. We call that strength the force. Okay? And this essentially we're going to come and find is basically Newton's second law, which we'll go to more in, we'll, go, we'll go more into tomorrow. So if we substitute these new terms into what we've been doing here with these interactions, right? We have the, you know, so a sub i, the acceleration of i divided by the acceleration of j. This would be equal to the movability of i over the movability of j as we we're using before, but remember that I'm defining mass as the inverse of movability, so that means that this is also equal to m sub, or m sub j over m sub i. The index is switched places, you see? Well, this suggests that m sub i times a sub i is equal to minus m sub j times a sub j, okay? And this will turn out to be Newton's third law. Okay? There's only one interaction, okay? Okay. And it only really has one strength, but you can see there's this kind of reciprocal relationship that the force on one is equal and opposite to the force on the other, you see? Yes. And we'll, we'll talk about that and kind of the traditional discussion of Newton's laws uh, in, in the next lesson. Um, but for now, this is just the motivation for why all of this is the way it is, okay? Okay. And so, based on these, you know, kind of pseudo-experimental results, right, these are 
I didn't really go under an ice rink and do these experiments, but if I did, this is the, these are the numbers I'd get, okay? Okay. If the players have the masses uh, that, that, that I use to generate this, these results, okay? All right. Okay, any, any questions on that?